So my name is Richard Nussel, and I am the Assistant Director of Admissions here at Marion University's College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, once again, I appreciate everyone being here today. You should have received an email um, from me, potentially two, and so all my contact information is in that. So if you want to reach out afterwards, feel free. Uh, my email is also here on this first slide, um, so you can uh, write that down, or like I said, um, I'll be sharing this with everyone too, so you can get it that way too. So, a little bit about what we're going to cover today. So, I'm going to go over the mission of the COM. I'm also going to talk a little about osteopathic medicine, um, since not everybody is going to be as familiar with what osteopathic medicine is. I'm going to talk about our curriculum, um, our residency placements. I'm going to go over the admissions process, our class profile, and then finally, I'll touch on our biomedical sciences master's program at the end. Um, if anyone's interested in that as well. So, for those of you that aren't from Indianapolis, or maybe those that are, but you haven't been here um, to our university before, uh, Marion University sits in Indianapolis. We're about 10, 15 minutes north of downtown Indianapolis. Um, and this is the building that the COM is housed in. So this is the Evans Center for the Sciences, and it was just finished in 2013. So this is a newer building. Um, with that being said, we also, all of your labs, your classes, everything actually take place in this one building. Uh, we all we also have an undergraduate campus, so you still have a lot of amenities that you would expect to find on an undergraduate campus. Um, we have athletics, so if you're interested in sports, you can still go see Marion University Sports. Um, you know, fitness centers, we have true dining halls, um, other fooderies, like we have a subway on campus, a pizza place, a Starbucks. Um, and I always say we, we have a real Starbucks. We don't just proudly serve Starbucks here. So if you want your sous vide egg bites or your pastries, you can get all that here at Marion as well. And I think that's one of the, the benefits of being on an undergrad campus um, and not just a, a standalone is we have a lot of those other amenities. And then in anticipation of questions, I assume we will get at the end which if you have questions, I ask that you would just send those in the chat um, for everyone to stay muted. Um, in regard to, to COVID-19, um, as of today, um, for, for the COM, they will be doing virtual lectures from 8 to 12. So you will have your lectures, but they will be virtual. And then we will be doing your osteopathic manipulative medicine lab, introduction to clinical medicine labs, still on campus in person, but we'll be breaking them up into smaller lab groups, okay? Um, so they're gonna kind of have a, a hybrid system, but so everyone's aware, um, those are the two biggest things I can think of in terms of impact of the classes, is that you'll have virtual lecture, and then you'll have smaller groups than normal for labs that will take place more spread out than, than they used to, all right? Um, so with that, we'll get started covering a little bit about uh, Marion University. So a little bit about our mission. So we're the second medical school in the state of Indiana. Um, like I said, our first class started in 2013, um, but we were founded in 2010. Um, and so one of the reasons that we came aboard is due to the physician shortage. So we are, our mission is that we want our graduates to go on and serve um, in primary care as well as in underserved or rural parts of the state or the nation. And we'll cover a little bit about our residency and how we're doing there. Uh, but like most DO schools, we do want our students to go into primary care, but no one is pushed into anything. You can go into any specialty that you want to go into. And then for those that are not familiar with what osteopathic medicine is, right? So I'm going to cover a little bit about that. Um, so some similarities between osteopathic medicine and allopathic medicine or DOs and, and MDs is you still have four years of medical school. You still have to pass comparable board exams. Um, DOs can actually take the USMLE, which is what the MDs take. Um, and then DOs have to take the complex, okay? Um, MDs are not able to take complex, and that is mostly because they don't get OMM, right? But everything else DOs learn is the same. So you're still getting that same medical knowledge. 
plus you're getting um, more work with the musculoskeletal system through OMM. Um, you have a wide range of specialty choices, any specialty you're interested in. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the differences, okay? So one of the biggest things I always say is when it comes to osteopathic medical education is that there's a the philosophy is that you're treating a whole person, okay? And so what osteopathic medical schools mean by that is you'll hear a lot of times that you have to treat the mind, body, and spirit, okay? So you're not just focused on a symptom, you're treating the whole person. So like any good physician, whether you're a DOMD, should be doing this. The idea is that this is getting instilled in you in medical school. So when our students graduate, it's just second nature to them. This is how they interact with patients. For instance, I see a DO, and when I go to my primary care provider, he will always ask me about what home life is like, what's my work life, my stress, my diet, my exercise, right? So he's trying to not just why I'm there, like I don't feel good, but he's also trying to get a sense of what's going on with my whole picture, right? Um, so he does that every time I go. Um, and so that just gives you an idea of, of, of what I mean by this whole person approach to medicine, right? You're not focusing on a symptom. You get extra training in the musculoskeletal system, and that really comes through osteopathic manipulative medicine, okay? So osteopathic manipulative medicine is a way to use your hands to diagnose and treat injury. Okay, so for a couple of examples for you, uh, let's say sacroiliac disorder or, or lower back pain. Okay, if you go to see an MD, they can prescribe medication, they could send you out for imaging, they could refer you out to physical therapy. Um, or if you went to see a DO, well, they could do all of those things. They are also trained in a way that they can treat the patient with their hands, right? Um, so that you're able to have this extra tool in your tool belt that you're able to treat your patient more holistically um, where you can actually treat this instead of referring them out, right? Or maybe instead of giving pain medication, you're able to treat it to try and hopefully get to the root cause and fix it instead of just treating the symptom, right, the pain. Uh, another example is acute appendicitis. Um, there would be no difference in how that is treated, right? Surgery, remove the appendix, antibiotics, right? So you're going you're gonna to treat it the same way. When it comes to diabetes, while the, the treatment methods are the same, you also learn about nutrition. So the idea is that osteopathic physicians are there to learn, to help their patients um, get more um, education through nutrition and exercise and really talk to them about these things to hopefully see if diet can help that. And then there's pneumonia. Pneumonia is similar to diabetes in that the treatment modalities are the same, but the difference is with OMM, DOs can learn to what they call palpate the lungs. So if you palpate the lower part of the lungs, that'll help break up the fluid and that can help get your patient um, better quicker. Um, I was talking to one of our students and there was a study that was put out um, and it was talking about GI surgery. So one of the things after you have GI surgery, you have to have a bowel movement before you are able to be um, discharged from the hospital. There was a study done that showed that patients that received an OMM technique to sort of help facilitate that were actually discharged one day earlier than those that did not get the same OMM treatment, okay? Or OMT, osteopathic medical treatment. Um, so I think it just goes to show you that, that there's real world examples in that one day, right? That's one last night in the hospital. The, the bills would be less, hopefully, one last day of potential medication. So it can have a big impact on your patient um, and, and, and their bill at the end of the day. There we go. So about one more slide um, about osteopathic medicine. Then we're going to get into to Marion University College specifics. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions about any of this, you can put it in the chat box and we'll get to, to all your questions at the end. So the percentage of DOs that are going into specialties has increased basically since, since 1984 to, to today is the main takeaway. So you hear a lot or I get a lot of questions. Oh, as a, as a DO, do I have to do primary care? Can I go into 
anesthesiology or something like that? And the answer is yes, uh, you definitely can. Um, but osteopathic physicians are serving at a higher percentage in, in rural or underserved communities, um, which is our mission. And then about a quarter of all medical students are currently enrolled at a College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, so that just gives you the, the, the sense that the profession itself is continuing to grow as more and more people are becoming more um, aware of it as an option. Okay, so a little bit about our curriculum. So here at Marion University, we have what's known as a systems-based curriculum. And the one exception to that is, is um, your first semester, and I'll cover that on the next slide. But the idea is that you're going to be getting both the biomedical sciences and the clinical medicine, or sort of those clinical skills at the same time, okay? So you'll have introduction to clinical medicine every semester, and that is when you start to work with standardized patients. Um, you also start to work with human patient simulators as you progress through the program. And so you can see here, we say we have early clinical lectures and engagement. Um, so through that introduction to clinical medicine, you work with standardized patients, which are actors we have come in, present symptoms to you. So it's more of a real world sort of example, right? We have um, about 10 exam rooms. So when you go in, it looks just like it would a doctor's office, okay? Um, and you actually start to interact with those standardized patients and you will start having these encounters in the first four weeks of the program. So at first it's gonna be a lot of that patient history and physical exam, okay? Because that's where you're gonna get a lot of the information you need. So we wanna make sure our students are proficient in patient history and physical exams. And then as you progress through the semester, you'll get more in depth and I'll cover that uh, here coming up. We are also doing interprofessional education with the School of Nursing. Um, so we also have a School of Nursing here at Marion University. And so you're going to be able to do interprofessional education with that School of Nursing. And they're constantly looking at ways that we can do more, um, right? Because healthcare providers, it's all about healthcare teams, right? So you're gonna start to get that sense of team and you're gonna start working with other professions while you're here on campus. So here's the didactic gear. And just so you're aware, almost everything we're gonna to cover today is on the website, um, including these exact pictures are taken right from the website if you wanna fall back on that, if you don't wanna take notes so you lose something, okay? So you can see this first semester here is your scientific foundations of medicine. And we say that's like all of your undergrad science classes put into a 16 week semester, okay? So that's really gonna help set you up and be the backbone for the rest of the, the curriculum. You're gonna have clinical anatomy, okay? So we do have um, full cadaver dissection here and you will have four to one student to cadaver ratios. Um, and then you have osteopathic principles and practice, which is really gonna be learning that osteopathic manipulative medicine I spoke about earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then you're going to have that introduction to clinical medicine, as I mentioned um, on the previous slide. And then you can see in the spring is where you get into the systems based curriculum. Okay. So, for instance, cardiopulmonary and renal systems um, is, is the spring semester. And so you're going to be covering the cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, and the renal systems. So, you will learn both how those systems work independently, how they work together. Um, for instance, let's say you're talking about the cardiovascular system and you're talking about uh, um, a heart drug, right, a pharmaceutical. So while that drug is there to help improve heart function or whatever cardiovascular disease is that you're covering, it might also work in the renal system. So you're seeing how those systems are also working together. Um, and then you're, so you're still getting more anatomy and physiology, biochemistry, pharmacology, microbiology, genetics, all of those things, but they're all systems-based. And then when it comes to your uh, uh, principles and practice and your introduction to clinical medicine, those also follow the same systems. So let's say for cardiovascular system, for your introduction to clinical medicine course, your standardized patient might come in and they present with cardiovascular disease, right? So now it's what are the pertinent um, history questions you ask for someone with cardiovascular disease? What is that physical diagnosis that you that you would do um, to try and help diagnose that? What are the labs you would order? How do you interpret those labs? So it kind of, as, as I mentioned, it gives you the, the basic sciences and the clinical medicine all put together. So it really helps things flow in terms of your studies, as well as how it works in the books 
and in real time with your patients, right? And then um, you'll also have um, fall and spring in your second semester would be set up in the same way, okay, in terms of being that systems-based curriculum. So we also have research. So I put this slide here because I always say a little bit, well, I'll talk a little bit about our academic calendar. Between your first and second year, we say is like your last real summer you're ever going to have in your entire lifetime, probably. Okay. So some of our students choose to start doing research in that summer because um, you don't have any classes or anything set up. So you can do research here on campus. For those of you that are out of state or maybe you're in state but you weren't aware, um, according to the Wall Street Journal, um, we're actually the life sciences hub of the U.S. You can see there's over 800, over 825 medical device companies or drug manufacturers here in Indiana. Um, and so within Marin, there's networkings where students are able to get research outside of campus. Um, but there's also a lot of bench research opportunities here on campus. And we also have opportunities for students to do clinical research um, as well with one of our hospital uh, partners. So just know that if you're someone that is interested in research, um, that you, you do have that option. I mean, most students start exploring that second semester and looking for labs and they actually start their bench research in the summer. Um, and then when you go from second year to third year, that's when you have to take level one of Comlex, okay? So you'll be studying for your boards and taking your boards that summer um, before you start third year, which will start your clinical rotations, okay? Excuse me. So a little bit about our clinical rotations. So you can see here for your third year schedule, um, you will do all of these rotations, but you might not do them in this order. But this at least gives you an idea of how your rotations will be set up. Also, about 90% of your rotations will be within a 60 mile radius of Indianapolis. So you also know you're going to stay local. Um, and then if we send you outside of that 60 mile radius, we'll have housing provided for you. Um, so you don't have to worry about paying for rent in two different locations because you get sent on a way rotation or something like that. Okay. Um, also, third year, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize. Third year is mostly primary care based, as you can see, but you're still going to have other things like surgery, um, also have an elective. Um, so you can try and set up something if you know you're really interested in cardiology or, or pediatric oncology or something like that. You can try and get something like that set up third year. And then your fourth year um, is when you're really going to be able to start exploring where you want to go for residency. So you can see it's mostly electives and selectives. But a lot of the reason for that is that it gives you the flexibility to do away rotations or on rotations, right? Um, so if you're really interested in pediatrics um, and you know you want to go to potentially match at Phoenix Children's Hospital or Riley Children's Hospital here in town, right? You're able to try and set up rotations at those sites um, so that you can hopefully increase your chances of getting interviews or matching there for residency. And so fourth year is a little more flexible. Now we do have an entire clinical education team here that's here to help you navigate those. We also, like I said, we have over 200 clinical partners. So it's not like you're just on your own. We have sites we're able to help you if you're wanting to stay local, there's teams here to help you find all those local rotations. But if you're someone that's out of state, um, your fourth year is where you're able to try and start setting up those out of state rotations if you want to try and go back home or somewhere else for, for residency potentially. But I appreciate everyone bearing with me. The, the virtual presentation format is a lot of me talking and less interaction up front, um, but I will get to all your questions at the end. Um, and, and I appreciate everyone being here today and hopefully we're getting some good um, some good uh, information out of this as well. So one of the things I think Marion does really well is student wellness. Um, I've been at two different health sciences um, education universities um, and I think Marion is one of the best I've been at. And so we take student wellness very seriously here. Um, so we have a 
wellness league. And so part of that wellness league is there's something set up during the semester, Monday through Friday. OK, so, you know, every day of the of the of the week minus the weekend. So every day during the week for about an hour, there's going to be something set up that's not going to be academic based. And the idea is that you're able to sort of unwind and relax. OK, so Mondays is yoga. Tuesdays is what we call tea Tuesday. So we actually have like a tea station set up in the lobby and that way you can come, you can interact, staff, faculty, other students. You can also just grab and go if you don't want to hang out, right? You can still just come get a tea. Um, Wednesdays is an activity, um, normally something that we, you make with your hands and then you um, get to take that with you. So we've done felt succulents, um, we've done stress balls, um, what else have they done? Um, they did like heat packs with rice that you could microwave or freeze, right? Um, and all of that is, you know, no cost to you. You don't have to pay for these events. You just get to come. You sit around with your 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 classmates or staff. I've gone to some of them, um, and you just get to talk and do these things, and then you get to take something back with you. Um, Thursdays tends to be a fan favorite, and that's Therapy Dog Thursdays, and we have Therapy Dogs in the lobby. Um, and then Friday is what we call Fit Friday, so it's normally some sort of physical activity. Think soccer, basketball, um, spike ball, ultimate frisbee, things like that. So just something to get you moving, okay? Um, but it's really nice that you, you have this outlet. And when we switch to virtual content delivery in March uh, due to the coronavirus, um, we were still hosting these things virtually, right? So that we had students running yoga through Instagram, and they were, I know, one day for the, the um, when you build something on Wednesdays, they had a virtual webinar on how to, like, make um, these different types of blankets and things like that. So we were still interacting with our students virtually for these things. Um, we do have a fitness center on campus that was just finished about a year and a half to two years ago. So all brand new equipment, new facilities. Um, we also have free counseling services on campus in a different building um, that's free for our students to use to talk about anything you need to talk about. Um, we also do really good mentorship here, I think. So you will get an upper class mentor. So if you're an incoming student, you'll get that student that's transitioning from first to second year. Um, you'll get a faculty mentor that you'll have. And then we have a, an optional sort of clinical mentor. So it's a clinician in the community. You can sign up for that and then you can get a third sort of mentor with someone that's actually a clinician in the community. Um, so we, I think we do mentorship really well that you can go to for people with academic mentorship, clinical mentorship, you know, uh, what's, what's it like to be an upperclassman, right, when they're in your shoes. Um, so you, you get a lot of different people to help you here. Um, we also have learning support specialists. So we have someone devoted to our master's student, uh, our biomedical sciences master's students and our first year medical students. And then we have someone devoted to our second and third year medical students. And then we have someone devoted to just our fourth year medical students who's really there to help you navigate residency applications, and interviews. He sets up a lot of different events. Um, to really help students like we did an event um, that I participated in last year we had about 100 volunteers on campus and the idea was like you had three minutes with each person and it was how do you come in and out of conversations right when you're like at the hospital or on the elevator and you run into residency program directors or people you might want to write letters of rec or, or get rotations with so he really tries to think of things that that can really be beneficial to the students um, we also have tutoring services, um, so we have both group and private tutoring available. Um, and then there's a bunch of student organizations. I think we have over 30 student organizations on campus through the COM, from everything from the pediatrics club to wilderness medicine um, to uh, we have like a crock pot club. Um, and so really we have things for both medicine based to non medicine based. Okay. And one question I get a lot, um, Marion University is a Catholic institution, okay? And so a question I get a lot is how does that impact our curriculum here at, at Marion? And so for the most part, the, the Catholic background is not going to affect your curriculum, right? There's no such thing as Catholic medicine. You're just going to learn medicine, 
okay? But where our, our Catholic um, institution really comes in is a lot of these student organizations, is ways to get involved. Um, if you're looking to increase spirituality, both Christian or non, we have student organizations for that. We have an organization called the Franciscan uh, Physician Vocation Program. Um, and so that's really a way that you can really start channeling um, your, your spirituality here um, is through some of the organizations we have on campus. We also have a chapel in our building um, that has mass um, and things like that. But if you're someone that is not religious or you're not Christian, you, you know, everyone's welcome here um, and it wouldn't impact your daily life. Um, but it's if you're someone that's interested in that, it's definitely here and you're definitely able to foster those those um, relationships. All right. So a little bit about residency. So for our class that just placed um, this March of 2020, we had 100% placement, 100% match rate, okay? You can see 67% matched in primary care, which is family medicine, internal medicine, OB-GYN, and pediatrics. Um, and then 66% matched in Indiana or the surrounding states. So if you're someone from the Midwest, um, know that we have a large student population that match out here. But we also matched in 23 different states this year. So we are spread out from California to, to Virginia. So we're really spread out through the entire US. Uh, but we, you know, we're really, we're really localized here, but that's because we're in the Midwest. But know that if you're from out of state, you, you have a good chance of going somewhere um, out of state if you'd like to go back. So you can see our top five specialties here, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, emergency medicine, and anesthesiology. Uh, so that just goes back to, you know, you, you don't have to do primary care here. Um, I don't have, I, uh, last year we placed in 18 different specialties. I don't have the list for this year's right now. If you email me, um, I know we're working on getting all of that put together. Um, and then last year for the class of 2019, you can see there was 18 different specialty areas. I would assume this year's match was pretty similar. And then this kind of shows you how we're spread out through the US. Um, we just don't have all uh, the, the fancy map yet for this this current match, um, but I wanted to put this up here. The class of 2019 had a 98.8 percent match rate. Um, so historically, we've done really well um, in the match. OK. So I'm just going to touch on Indianapolis really briefly, um, but but just know that I always say it's good, sort of a big city with a small town feel um, in terms of being from Indi I'm not from Indianapolis. I've lived here for about two years. I'm originally from Texas, um, but we've really enjoyed our time here in Indianapolis. Everyone's friendly. Um, the city's big, but you can get just about anywhere you want in about 15, 20 minutes, um, which is nice. If we're so much interested in sports, um, you can see here we have most of the major sports, um, even baseball for minor league. Um, arts and cultures, we have Indianapolis Museum of Art, which is actually maybe five minutes from here. Um, great art museum, they have a ton of outdoor space. Um, some of it's even free, some of the outdoor space. The food's good, I don't have students that go there to study. Um, and then students also get a free membership to the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Um, then we have a symphony, we have the world's largest children's museum. Um, I have kids and we go and I probably have as much fun as my, my son does. I'm going to some of our students that go. Um, but there's a lot to do here. It's the state capital, the biggest city. So there's a lot of different arts, entertainment, and we are historically below the average cost of living. So it is a um, fairly affordable city to live in. Okay, so now we'll touch on the admissions process. So for those of you that haven't applied before or maybe are looking to apply um, in the future, your primary application is going to come through a COMIS, okay? And so they've already opened. They open up in May, and we just started receiving applications, okay? June 15th, they just started releasing applications to the COMS. Uh, we haven't started sending out any supplemental applications yet. That will be coming here if you've already applied and you're verified. That will be coming up in the next week or two is the current timeline, okay? Um, we're just waiting. Um, some of the letters of rec haven't been pushed through yet, and so we're just waiting to get everyone's applications finalized before we start doing that. But no, that should be coming um, 
Actually, I lied. I just got a live update. They are being sent right now. So if you're verified, um, you will probably be getting a supplemental right now as we speak. Um, and then in terms of interviews, this year for the fall, we are switching to virtual interviews. So if you've applied, um, know that in the fall, we'll be doing a virtual interview setup. Um, the plan is to still um, have an interaction with a student um, as well as get some presentations, okay? Um, so you're still going to be getting a lot of the interview day. The only thing you won't really be getting right is what's campus feel like getting that tour. Um, we do have a virtual tour on our website if you want to see the evidence center and some of the labs I've mentioned. Um, but as of right now, just know that we'll be doing virtual interviews in the fall and we will reassess towards the end of fall to determine if we will continue virtual interviews in the spring, okay? And then you can see there's an admissions committee decisions at the very end. So a lot of this takes time, right? So we're going to get a COMIS applications. If you haven't applied, they say it could take up to four weeks to verify your application. Once we get those, we try and turn around supplementals within two days or so, um, depending on how many we get. And then once you've turned your supplemental application, paid your fee, we then go in and then we look at your letters of recommendation. OK, so know that it could take us maybe three weeks to verify your letters of recommendation, which I'll cover what those requirements are in a later slide. And then once your letters of record cleared, you'll get a, an email saying that your application is complete and that it can take an additional three weeks to get a decision on if you get an interview or not. OK, so it is a lengthy process. When it comes to interviews, we tend to get back to you within a week. OK, so traditionally we interview on Fridays with the occasional Saturday and then the committee meets on Tuesdays. So you would find out most people within five days. OK, now with virtual interviews, it might be a little over a week because we might interview on not just Friday. We'll probably add Mondays and things in there. So it might be a, a week that you wait. But for the most part, once you interview, we get you a decision very quickly and we don't make you wait around anymore once we interview you. OK. So I won't really cover all these, right? You can see them, they're on our website. They're your pretty standard prerequisite courses. Just know that these need to be completed by July 15th of matriculation year. So for those of you that are applying currently, these courses need to be done by July 15th, 2021. If you have any questions about course equivalencies, just reach out to me and I'll let you know if it counts or not, okay? We don't check any prerequisites until you're accepted into the COM. So, um, that's when we will start doing that, okay? And I did see a question pop up and know that um, I'll get to that question at the end, okay? Because it disappeared and I'll have to close down this screen real quick to find it. So in terms of your letters of recommendation, one of the reasons I cover this is because I'm always surprised at the amount of people that don't submit the required letters, okay? You have to have a letter from a physician, DO or MD. Now with COVID, we are in active talks. Um, we've gotten quite a few emails from students that maybe aren't able to get a letter um, due to having uh, the, the physician they worked with being immersed with COVID or maybe some of their experiences got canceled due to COVID that they had set up. Um, so know that we're, we're in active talks about that requirement, but, but for now we are requiring it. Um, you have to have a letter from a science professor. We consider sciences, biologies, chemistries, or physics, okay? And then you have to have a pre-med or pre-health committee letter um, or a pre-med advisor. And if you do not have a committee or an advisor, we'll take a second science professor, okay? If your letters are not coming from the biologies, chemistries, or physics um, departments, know that they get a they can be approved on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's really going to depend a lot of times on the course. Um, let's, for a lot of times we won't accept, um, let's say like a general psychology <clears throat> letter, but we might take a neuroscience from the psychology department, right? So it's really going to depend if it's outside of that realm, but just keep that in mind, okay? And then you can see here, letters of rec can be submitted through a Columbus Interfolio or virtual evals, all right? And as we check your letters after we get your secondary, know that if you're missing something, we will email you. So you won't just sit there. We will end up emailing you to say, hey, you're missing X. Or uh, maybe 
um, your physician letter wasn't signed or on letterhead, so we'll say we need one of those, okay? So when you're asking for letters from people, make sure you let them know that it needs to either be signed and we'll accept a digital signature or be on letterhead. Um, last year, I got a letter um, that I think the person might have typed up like in the notes application on their iPhone, right? And it was just submitted. It had the lines and everything. And so I had to let that person know, hey, we don't accept this. Please reach out to Dr. So-and-so and have them submitted on letterhead or signed. And I got an updated letter within a week and then that person's application moved on, okay? So just know we will work with you on that. All right, a little bit about our class profile. Um, and that, in, in, I'm going to go over sort of how we look at applications uh, when we go through some of this. So this is our academic profile, okay? So you can see the average GPA was a 3.65, the average MCAT was a 5.04, okay? And you can see we had 4,577 applications, uh, I guess this is technically two years ago for the class of 2023. Last year we received about 5,200, so we did have a big jump. Um, so when we're assessing academics, right, we don't just look at the number and move on, okay? So we are going to look at trends in grades, right? We're going to say, how have you done in the upper level sciences? So just like we try and teach a holistic approach to, to healthcare here, that whole person approach, that also carries into our admissions uh, processing, right? So we're not going to just screen you out because you have a 3-2 or something like that, right? We're going to go through and say, okay, is there an upper trend? Do they have a master's, right? Do they have graduate level science coursework? Um, and same thing with the MCAT score. We're going to go in and look at see what are your individual subsection scores and things like that. So I think we do a good job of trying to get a good academic picture, right? Because a 3-3, three, three, from two candidates can tell a completely different story. Someone could have a 3-3, but they have C's throughout their entire college transcript, right? Freshman through senior. Or you can have someone with a 3-3 who maybe struggled freshman or sophomore year, but has an upward trend and they're getting mostly A's or all A's by their senior year, right? And so that person with that upward trend is more likely to get that interview because we see that growth and that upward trend, okay? So um, I think we do a good job of really trying to assess some of that stuff. And then you can see here our average, or about 70% of the class was between 20 and 24, but the range was 21 to 37. Um, we actually had a higher uh, percentage of females in the class last year, 53 female to male. Um, race, uh, about 33 from diverse backgrounds, and then we always try and have about 50% of our class be from the state of Indiana. We get that question a lot. Um, you can see last year was 57%. We are a private, not-for-profit university, so it doesn't matter where you're from, tuition's the same. Um, everyone's looked at equally, um, but just know when we're, we're looking at that, we get a lot of Indiana applications as well, and so we, we're trying to make sure we're providing care in the state of Indiana, which is one of the reasons we're, we're trying to have that internal goal. And then when we look at non-academic pieces, right? So we've covered sort of how the academic review goes. When it comes to non-academic, we're gonna be looking for clinical experiences, right? Is it paid, volunteer? Have you had any shadowing? We're gonna get into what sort of extracurricular activities ha have you been a part of? Uh, we like to see leadership, right? So were you president, vice president, things like that of your of your clubs? Were you volunteering? Um, so once again, the mission is to really give back to underserved or rural populations, right? So are you volunteering um, for, for populations in need? Are you volunteering at hospice, free clinics, boys and girls clubs, homeless shelters, things like that? So we go through the entire application. Um, to really see, are you a mission fit? Are you an academic fit? Before really making that decision, do you get an interview or not? And I've seen a lot of questions pop in. Um, so now that we're almost at the end of the presentation portion, and then I'll just start going through all the questions for everybody, okay? So I'm gonna to touch on our biomedical sciences program uh, briefly. I know I had a couple reach out, um, wondering if it would be covered as well. Um, so we're currently in our application cycle. So if you're someone that is graduated or looking to improve on your acad uh, academic component of your application or gain research experience or something like that, um, our application deadline is July 24th and you would start this August, 
okay? Um, so this is something you can apply for now. We have waived the fees to apply this year. Um, you can apply directly through our website. Um, but if you come in and you get at least a 3.5 in your fall semester, then you have a 497 or higher on the MCAT, you're guaranteed an interview to um, our College of Osteopathic Medicine, right? So you'd interview in the spring after we get your fall grades, okay? So you're taught by medical school faculty, um, not all, but a good portion of our BMS faculty also teach for the medical school. Um, you also get interaction with medical school faculty. Um, you will also have, um, they will do simulations in the sim lab where they will also interact with medical school faculty. So you get to know Marion University, some of the, the student body and faculty really well being here. Okay. Um, it is a rigorous program, but the idea is it helps prepare you for the rigors of medical school. Um, and so last year, about 80% of our master's students that interviewed here were offered admission at Marion, okay? Um, so just know that if you're someone that's looking into a program like this, that Marion does have one, and you can reach out to me if you have questions about that or applying. So we'll cover these important dates, um, and this is the time that I will let you know that we do have rolling admissions. So it is important, and this is for Marion University's College of Osteopathic Medicine, not the BMS program, okay? So for the comm, we do have rolling admissions. So you really want to make sure you're getting your applicant as early as possible. We normally say getting your application in by August, for the most part, is considered early, okay? But the deadline is February 1st, getting your primary, and then the deadline to get in your supplemental and all other application materials is March 1st. We tend to interview in September through April, okay? Uh, but just keep in mind that you want to apply as early as you can to give yourself the best chance because we give out class seats as we go, right? So we start interviewing in September, then about five days after that first interview day, we'll start filling class seats. Now, we will always have seats open for an interview day, all right? So we will make sure we have seats saved, but know that when you start and our class size is 150 on that first day versus the last day where there might be five seats left, right? It gets a little more competitive in what the committee is looking for. So with that being said, I will open it up to questions. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen now. Um, and that way I should be able to start seeing the chat box to see everyone's questions. Okay. So let's see. And here I'll bring it over to the screen with the camera so you're not looking at my profile the whole time. So one of the questions is, is Marion being blinded to MCAT scores this cycle? Can someone receive an interview with an upcoming MCAT score? Okay, so that's a great question. So the answer to that is no. We are still requiring an MCAT score to be sent a supplemental application. So if you submit without an MCAT, we will put you on what we call a hold for MCAT. You will get an email letting you know we've put you on a hold until we get your MCAT score. And then once that MCAT score gets into a COMIS, we'll get it on our next download, basically. Um, and so we go in about weekly to check our updated MCATs, and that's where we end up processing you over to that supplemental side, okay? Um, but but know that we are, we're still holding you for, for MCAT, because that's something the committee uses when they make those decisions after interview. And we don't want someone to interview. And then let's say you get a 485, uh, which is below our cutoff of a 494. So you wouldn't even be eligible for a secondary. So you would have paid money for your secondary uh, when you should have been eligible, right? Now, if you already have an MCAT score that, that meets the minimum 494, um, we'll probably end up processing you with a supplemental and then we'll wait to get that that updated score in when it comes in. But know that if you have an MCAT score in already, you can start that process of the supplemental. But if you've never taken it, you're going to be put on hold. Um, someone said they're interested to know about the virtual interview. How does it look like or what does it look like? So good question. Um, so how it stands now, right? Obviously, this could be subject to change. Excuse me. Um, you'll interview with two um, staff or faculty um, from the comm, right, um, for 30 minutes. And then from there, the plan is that we will have 
a date. If it's not the same day as your interview, it might be a later date in the same week that we will have a student Q&A panel where you will get to come in and interact with two different students. And then we'll also have a sort of like a presentation covering more about the curriculum and wrap up and things like that. So um, there, there could be a chance if on your day you get to do all three on the same day and knock it out. But depending on the day, you could interview like on a Monday, but then you come back Friday for the student Q&A and in the, in the virtual presentation. OK, um, and so how interviews work before COVID-19 you would have two 15 minute one on one interviews, right? So now we've combined it to be a one or a, a two on one 30 minutes. So you're still getting the same amount of interview time. You're still getting the same amount of time with students for the most part um, with that Q&A. The only thing you're really missing is that tour, which was led by students, but hopefully you'll get some student interaction with that Q&A, okay? So we're trying to make it as similar to pre-COVID as we can, um, because we think our student body and getting to see faculty is something that's gonna help you make that decision um, and our students are happy here. Um, and so we wanna make sure you get that, that sort of campus feel. And then it says, what if you're a non-traditional student? Can you have more physician letters? So the answer to that is no, the, the committee does require you to have those science faculty or pre-med advisor letters, okay? Now, the one sort of exception to that is we will accept a research letter from a PI. So if you're doing research, you could use your PI to write a letter and we'll count that towards that academic sort of requirement, but you would still need um, one other academic letter, okay? Do we have to submit three letters if we have a committee letter and a letter packet with a DO? Um, so that's a good question. So <clears throat> in terms of that, no. If your committee letter has those letters attached and they all come in that committee packet, that's fine. We would accept that as, as being all three checked off, okay? Um, so that's fine if they all come together. Would a research professor count? Yes, I just sort of covered that. Uh, do I have to finish the secondary application in about seven to 10 days? No, you have until March 1st to turn in your supplemental application, okay? Once again, rolling admission, so we'll try and start working on it. There are, don't quote me, but there's you know, roughly five or so um, sort of short answer questions on that supplemental, so you'll need to take some time to think about it and, and write. But we don't have a, a hard cutoff like once you get it you have a week you have as much time as you need up until march 1st don't wait till march 1st okay um let's see um your website says that you focus on the last 120 credit hours in science courses when evaluating a candidate does that mean that you calculate your own internal values aside from ocomus gpas um so the answer to that is no, we don't recalculate anything. Um, so we do use all of ACOMIS's GPA calculations, including your the cumulative application uh, or the cumulative GPA calculation, I should say. Um, but you know, some of that when we're when we're looking at a candidate is looking through those trends and grades, how have they done recently, um, and things of that nature. But we're not going to recalculate any GPAs, okay? Let's see, I'm an international student. Can I connect to the current international student at your school? Is there any extra documents I need to prepare for your application? Um, so if you email me, I will reach out to one of our international students to see if they're comfortable with me sharing their emails. Most of our students are. So just email me and I can get you in contact with that, uh, with one of our students. In terms of extra documents, when it comes to the application, not really. The only thing that we end up asking is for a verification of your of your visa status, if you have one, right? So we know if you're on F1 visa or something else, but that doesn't necessarily a hold up in the application process, other than we need to know before we move you on. Um, but if you're admitted, um, you'll work with our international um, sort of student affairs um, coordinator. And so they'll work with you on getting any documentation they need, proof of financial ability to pay, things like that. Does Marion have a history of accepting older non-traditional career changers? Um, 
So we don't we don't discriminate based on age at all. So I don't know the history in terms of the oldest student ever admitted. Like I said last year, there was someone the age range was twenty one to thirty seven. Um, but know that we don't really assess age. So you have just an equal shot of someone coming right out of undergrad. Um, and then there are any scholarships that students may apply to. So that's a great question. So we do have some scholarships at Marion University. Um, so we have a, a Indiana primary care scholarship that's open to anyone, whether you're you're from the state of Indiana or not. Um, it's a fifteen thousand dollars scholarship you're able to get. Um, the caveat, I guess I should say, is is that every year you take it, you're saying that's how many years of primary care you're going to do in the state of Indiana. So if you take it four years, you're saying you're going to do four years of primary care in Indiana. If you end up not doing that, you then pay back those loans. But if you do it, that's your debt paid and you never have to repay the money. Um, residency does count for that. We get that question a lot too. So if you know you're interested in primary care um, and you're planning on staying in Indiana, it's it's something to definitely look into applying because um, it's open to all students. And then we do have some other scholarships available, scholarships you know based on on need and diversity and things like that that students are able to apply to and that's outside of any sort of outside scholarships right national health service corps military with their hpsp loans things like that so there's other outside entities that you can get scholarships from <clears throat> well classes for the oh i just scrolled and missed there it is well classes for the master's degree be on site or virtual this fall <coughs> That's a great question. So the master's program currently is planning on having on-site um, um, classes. So it is a smaller class size as well. Um, it's about half the size of the DO. Um, they are currently working on how to do um, um, social distancing guidelines with exams um, and things like that. But there's not many labs with BMS outside of some of the, the Sim Center labs and case studies. Um, so as of now, the plan is that those will be in person, but they have backup plans if for some reason we start to see spikes and we have to, to, to go to virtual. Um, we, as, uh, as, as a comm, both the, the BMS and the DO program, have always video recorded lectures, and so we definitely already have that set up available for faculty to record lecture, lectures and disseminate those to students, okay? Um, are research opportunities limited, or do most students who wish to do research get opportunity to do so? As far as I have heard, um, there's been opportunities for students that want to do research to do research. Okay, um, if you're if you're interested, reach out to me, and I can reach out to um, Dr. Jonathan Lowry, who who runs the the research sort of arm, if you will, of the com, to, to see if he's ever seen that there's not enough. Or how that works um, and I know they're really willing to work with students um, through our networking um, I know I had a student that a prospective student is interested in epidemiology research at one point um, and he said that you know we don't have any here however we have some faculty that also do research at the state health department so we can get in contact there to see if maybe we can get an epidemiology project set up from the state health department or something like that okay um so so i know they're also really able to or really willing to work with the student and network to try and find opportunities if they can um do you accept an international bachelor's degree um it's been evaluated yet yeah, so we are we are a school that does accept international students um if it's outside of most of the canadian english-speaking canadian countries if it's french-speaking canadian or otherwise it does have to have that uh course by course evaluation done by west or one of the other ones listed on um a compass's website for for application instructions but but you can't apply do we offer medical mission trips? That's a great question. Um, so we do have a, a branch of Timmy Global Health here. And so that's one of our student groups. It's very similar if your um, um, undergrad had say global medical brigades or something like that, right? So Timmy Global Health is also similar in that they are doing international medical missions and our students are able to go on medical missions either through Timmy Global Health uh, I know in the past, uh, one of some of our faculty members have taken um, students to, I believe, is Honduras, um, and so that's definitely potential to do that. There's also the potential if you want to get involved locally 
um, our students volunteer at free clinics in the area, and that just restarted uh, this month where they're able to start volunteering at the free clinics. Uh, with, with COVID, they kind of shut down all those volunteer opportunities, which I'm sure most of you or some of you experience in your own. Um, but just know that if you're interested in, in sort of medical missions, both here locally with free clinics or abroad, that you can get involved in that. Um, with the free clinics, you can get involved first semester here at medical school volunteering at a free clinic. Uh, which email should be used for specific questions for application? You can email me or you can email Daniel Goodpaster. He's also uh, on our website. It's dgoodpaster.edu. Most of you should have my email already because um, how you found out about this was a, was an email from me. Um, so you can just send it out to me and I can, can let you know where you're at with your application. How are multiple MCAT scores evaluated with the most recent score be only considered? So if someone has multiple MCAT scores, we look at the highest score within three years. Okay, so when you see our average MCAT score on our website, that is that person's highest score within three years. Okay, um, so it doesn't mean it's the most recent, but the committee does take into consideration if your most recent score has gone down, right? So we still look at that and evaluate that and you know depending on how much it goes down right like a point or two maybe not as big of an issue but we've seen six to eight point drops sometimes right and that becomes a concern for the committee so um something to keep in mind let's see my application has been verified is there a way for me to mark my application as applying through pre-medical fast track program um yes um so for that, on the supplemental application, there will be a question. You can also email Daniel Goodpaster and let him know, um, as well as your advisor can reach out to, to Daniel Goodpaster as well. But that way, you, you make sure we know it's coming down the pipeline for one of the schools um, that we have that partnership with. Good question. Let's see. If you're waiting on an additional MCAT score, the application is held until you receive the most recent. I have a score that meets the minimum, but we'll be taking it at the end of the summer. Um, so for that question, um, if you have an MCAT score that's in already, we will process you and send you a secondary application. We will end up holding on the full final review in terms of interview or not until we get your most updated score. But at least you get your secondary and you start getting to process some of that. Um, it takes out some of that lag time for you. Um, but no, we end up waiting because if you're taking the time to take the MCAT again, we're going to make sure we have that score before we make a final decision. Um, but you will get the supplemental application still. Are the clinical rotations during third and fourth year set up to be working amongst DO physicians specifically, or do the students work with both MD and DO physicians? Great question. You will work with a mix of DO and MD uh, preceptors. One question. I do have... <clears throat> I have a, blah, 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 a biology requirement. I have a seven credit since my first biology course in my university did not include a lab. Will I just have to take a higher level science course to make up for that, or will I not be eligible since I do not meet general biology requirement? Is there a global health program at MUCOM? Has there a club that is global health? Okay. So in terms of that one credit hour, for biology, it's a little bit more easy to make up because if you've got multiple upper level biology courses, like you said, we can sub that in. It's a little bit harder for the chemistries because we require OCHEM and BioCHEM, okay? So sometimes you might have to take additional course or something, but for biology, this question specifically, yes, we can use an upper level biology course to fulfill that one hour. Um, and I know the medical mission trips has been asked, is there a global health program that MUCOM has? So we do have Timmy Global Health, uh, which is a student organization with a faculty advisor um, with uh, the, as far as I know, that sort of mission statement for that organization is medical mission, uh, international health, things like that. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, uh, maybe we can set up a phone call or I can get you in contact with someone from the Timmy Global Health organization that they can be a little bit more detailed um, on that for you. 
Are there current ambassadors that are available to field questions and offer a student's perspective via email, or is it only faculty that are available to answer questions and then student involvement on that data review? Good question. No, if you want to reach out to a current student, email me and I'll get you in contact with a current student. Okay. Um, know that it is summer, so maybe they're not as quick to respond, and our second years are, are studying for boards. Um, so there might be a little lag time, but definitely email me and I'll get you in contact with some of our ambassadors, okay? And it seems like I might get a lot of emails after this presentation, so no, I might not respond like within an hour or two. It might be, you know, 24 to 48 hours, but I will get back to you. And then let's see, what's the next question? Could a writing intensive course that isn't technically English fulfill part that course requirement? Answer is yes. Um, if it's not in the English department, um, sometimes if there's a course description that says it's writing intensive or fulfills your university's writing requirement, we'll waive it. If it doesn't and we get a syllabus um, from that course that shows that at least 50% is writing components, we'll also count that towards that English writing component. Okay. Um, so we've accepted a lot of different courses for that. Let's see, I heard that students have the ability to volunteer at two different free clinics. What year are students able to begin volunteering and what does volunteering entail? Great question, I covered it a little bit, but yes, there are free clinics. Um, as far as I am aware, um, your first year, first semester, you know, a lot of it might help with like triage and intake. And then as you go through the program, you get to start helping with like vitals and things of that nature. So, so your responsibilities sort of um shift as you learn more through the medical program okay if you took the mcat the first time and had a low score should we wait for the second score before we apply great question so you know if the only thing you're waiting on is the mcat um you're more than welcome to apply now to take out a lot of that lag time through a comus okay and us receiving your application um just make sure that on the comus application you've selected that you have a planned mcat or you email us to say you have a planned MCAT. Because if we don't see a planned MCAT and it's not a 494, it's so below our cutoff or our minimum, I should say, um, you would be sort of, um, you would get that email saying that you're not invited for interview because you didn't meet our minimum requirements. Um, or if you meet it and it's above a 494, you will get processed on. And if we make a decision before you tell us, we don't go back and revisit applications after a decision's been made. But as long as we know before a decision's been made, we'll put you on hold, okay? So either through the application or email. But if you're not waiting on anything, I normally recommend people just apply to get it in the system. Otherwise, you're waiting for your MCAT score, then you apply, then you're waiting maybe another four weeks for COBUS to send it to us. So there's a lot of, a lot of lag time there if you wait. If our undergraduate GPA doesn't meet your minimum academic requirements, but your post -bac GPA is a 4.0, can we still receive a secondary? So that's a good question. So your cumulative GPA still has to meet that minimum requirement, okay? So you still have to have at least a 3.1 GPA, okay? Um, so with post -bac and that, if it's a 3.1, that's great. If it's still below, you wouldn't be sent to secondary um, because you don't meet that minimum requirement. But you can reach out to me if you have questions about that or send me transcripts and I can try and take, um, calculate your combined GPAs to see where, where your true cumulative GPA is, okay? Uh, is lecture attendance mandatory in the first two years? So <clears throat> this year, we're gonna be doing virtual um, lectures now your lab components will be mandatory and then let's say that this was not a covid year let's say you're applying next year or something um we've never had mandatory attendance for lecture um at the com uh, or sorry to say the the osteopathic medical school but you still are going to have labs and different things that are going to be required okay um so you still end up coming to campus quite a few days of the week for other mandatory things, but lecture itself is not mandatory because um, we've always video recorded those lectures and, and sent them out to the students, okay? Well, let's see, where are we? For the 15,000 primary care scholarship, can I work any primary care job I choose or must it be in an underserved area? Great question. Um, as long as it's in primary care, uh, that's what meets that, that requirement here, okay? 
And if you want to learn more about it, um, you can email me and I'll get you some information. What type of teaching do you employ for the classes? So for the most part, it's your sort of standard lecture base uh, courses, okay? So, you know, you have PowerPoints up, but um, that doesn't mean there's not some, you know, flipped classroom in terms of, you know, questions throughout. Um, you're also gonna have case studies, but if you wanna think about it, it's gonna be your sort of traditional lecture, uh, but then we do have a lot of sort of early simulated clinical experiences and labs and things to help you sort of put that uh, information you're learning to, to use, right? So you're going to get the, the basic sciences and the application all at the same time, okay? If my pre-health advisor is now in a dean position at the school, can I still ask them to write a letter since they were technically during my school year? Yes, uh, just having the letter, they can they can mention how they were your pre-health advisor, and, and, and that's fine. Let's see. What program do students most enjoy about your school? Um, so that's a good question, um, and one that might be good for a current student. So definitely reach out to me. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that students really like about our school is that we have I feel like we have a nurturing learning environment, right? So that goes back to a little bit about that mentorship I talked about earlier in the presentation. Uh, we also have open door policy, right? So you can go up to the third floor and you can um, talk to faculty, right? Um, I've seen students come find student, uh, faculty in the lobby and they sit down. I've seen faculty say, hey, let's go get a coffee. Right? So our faculty are very approachable um, in that I think that students feel that they're very supported here. Right, so we used to say, um, or some that worked here, you know, they used to say, you know, you can go to any medical school in the country and become a physician, right? But if you want to come to Marion, know that we're going to push you to be the best physician you can be, but we are going to make sure you're supported and have the resources to do that, okay? Um, so I think that one of the biggest things, I think the students feel supported and that they have both sort of a mental health escape with counseling services, academic support, and mentorship. Um, so I think it's one of the, I would say, but email me, I'll get you contact with a student and you can maybe find out I was completely wrong. All right, let's see. If my pre-health, oh, I just answered that one, just to double check, is DO letter still required to be considered for interview? So we require a physician letter, DO or MD. It doesn't have to be DO solely, okay? So DO or MD letter. As of today, yes, we require it. Email me in two weeks and it could change, right? Uh, that's just the sort of the nature of, of where we're at right now, okay? Can we have your email? Yes, so for those of you um, that might have missed it earlier, um, it's either on the website or I'll drop it in the chat right now, uh, but it's rnussel at marion.edu. So that's R as in Rice, N as in Nancy, U-S-S-L-E at marion.edu. All right, and I guess there's some people on the phone too. So in case you weren't able to see the slides, hopefully that'll that'll help. And I just put it in the the general chat box too. If you are on the the WebEx, if we were considering applying to the BMS program, when would you suggest that we apply? So if you want to start this August, so literally less than two months for before classes start for the BMS program, uh, you can apply now. So July 24th is the deadline for that program. If you're looking to start in 2021, the application cycle for that will open back up in November of 2020 for the class that will start in August 2021, okay? But if you want to start this year, you can head to our website and, and you'll see there's uh, there's a code on the website for the application to be waived. It's all caps, BMS hyphen June 15. Uh, like I said, it's on the website or email me um, and it'll waive your, your fee. So it's free to apply right now, okay? um what does housing look like <clears throat> good question so we do have on-campus graduate housing okay it does fill up every year um so we do have a good good amount of students that live there uh, both medical and bms um and then students that live off campus okay so if you're not from the area know that indianapolis is a big city i mean there's apartments everywhere right from downtown that's 10 minutes from us roughly to Butler University is another 10 to 15 minutes from us. Um, so we have these two sort of private universities in this area, which tends to 
pull up a lot of housing for students, right? So both apartments, homes for rent, things like that. So um, just know that if you're interested, you can reach out to me. Once students are accepted, it, um, housing lists do end up getting sent out too. So we kind of send lists of where place students have lived in the past too, okay? But there's a ton, but the on-campus housing, there's a link on our website. It's called the Overlook at Riverdale and they're nice, you know, granite countertops, stainless steel appliances. They're more apartments than dorms. What would your advice be for applicants whose DO shadowing opportunities were canceled due to COVID? I worked very closely with DOs in an emergency department, but I've heard students interviewing DOs over the phone or even mentoring in their apps that they attended virtual presentations. Um, yeah, so, you know, if, if, if you've worked with DOs in the past, you know, make sure it's on your application, um, you know, things like that the committee likes to see, you know, but if you're unable to get a letter or something like that due to COVID, that's something that reach out to us and, and we'll see how we can work with you. Um, you know, I have heard students that have tried to set up, like you said, mentoring where they at least talk to DOs, right? If you've talked to a DO and they've, they've, um, you know, sort of mentored you, talked about the profession, and you're getting a letter from them, that's good. Um, traditionally, our physician letter needs to talk about clinical exposures, right? Shadowing, clinical work, something like that. But in the time of COVID, things are things are fluid. Um, so that's something that we can definitely discuss further if you're someone that doesn't have it. But hopefully, if you're applying now, you've already got some sort of clinical exposure, right? Um, and so if you do, hopefully that will lead into a letter or at least a way to see you've had some clinical exposure. Okay. Do you know how much financial aid students typically receive for the master's in biomedical sciences program? I don't remember what the cost of attendance is in total. The tuition for the program is roughly 38,000 for the BMS program. Now you can get FAFSA for that, right? So you can get financial aid to cover the program, cost of living, all of that stuff. Um, so in terms of getting aid, it's there if you're eligible, okay? If you email me, I can get you a cost of attendance sheet so you can see the breakdown for the year uh, with you know housing, cost of living, things like that in it too. Can you talk more about the OMM curriculum? How many hours per week does Mary offer OMM fellowship or other opportunities? Do the OMM classes interrelate with the current semester's coursework content? So good question. So I know how it's worked in the past is the idea is that the OMM relates to what's happening in the lecture with the systems based, right, as much as it can. Um, in terms of hours per week, I think they meet, it's how it currently was, was once a week for I think it was like a three or four hour block, maybe three hour lab. Um, now things might be different because um, of COVID and they're making smaller lab groups. Um, so if you email me, I'll get in contact with someone that's uh, one of the leads in the OMM department to see if anything's changing from this year to that year. Um, but no, with OMM, how it typically works is you're going to have OMM every single week for your first two years, right, in-person labs. And then your third and fourth year, you have sort of a longitudinal OMM course where you have like sort of online content and things like that too. So you will get OMM curriculum for the full four years. At this point, we don't have um, like a, a true fellowship, right, where you can come back for like a year between, say, second and third year or something like that. Um, but there are students who join sort of this like OMM club, and then they are able to come in um, and they help. So when they're a second year, they'll come in and help the first years with OMM and things like that. So you, if you're really interested in OMM, there's sort of like a club. You work with some of the OMM um, faculty, and then you can also help um, some of those underclassmen in their labs too. At what point in the process did you say that prereqs will be evaluated? Could I be rejected for lacking two credit hours of English? So prerequisite courses are evaluated after you've been offered admission. All right. So we normally send you an offer of admission and then we review your prereqs within 48 hours to clear those prerequisites. OK, so then, you know, two days after your admission, if you have anything missing and then you have till July 15th to get that taken. OK, 
So we accept courses from any regionally accredited university or college, including community colleges or online courses, right? So some students might just take an online open enrollment course to knock it out. Some students might have something that we're saying it doesn't count, but you might have a course that counts. So then we kind of work with you to clear those prereqs, right? So you wouldn't necessarily be rejected because you're missing two, but you would have a deadline to get those courses completed. Okay, and that's when we'll work with you, right? Let's say the only class you can get ends maybe a little after July. Every now and then we might waive it, but the goal is that you find something that's completed before July 15th. Are lectures recorded for later viewing on your own time? Yes, they are. They're up. Uh, we use something called um, Canvas here, and they use Panopto to record. So yeah, you'll be able to, uh, to view lectures at any point, and you can switch the speeds, right? Um, so if you want to turn it on one and a half speed, something like that, you can. What is special about your DO program that other schools do not have? Uh, so, you know, I don't know a ton about other DO schools, but some of the things that I think Marion does well, um, you know, some of it I, I, I think I've covered a little bit in that I think we do mentorship really well. Um, I think that our, our um, um, open door policies with our faculty is so that's, that that is good. We also have great lab spaces being a newer university that got to sort of design their spaces, right? So we've got 10 um, sort of simulated patient exam rooms, right, that look like a, an office. And they're made to simulate what boardrooms when you take step two or level two of boards look like, right? We even switched out all the tables last year, some of the same tables um so the idea is that they're trying to make sure when you walk into boards you're as comfortable as possible uh, we also do have board prep for our students and that you get three different board prep materials um, in your second year you get um combank which is like online questions you'll get um oh i just forgot the name it's it's a book um that you'll end up getting whose name i'm forgetting i apologize i'll forget it as soon as we in the chat um and then you also get like a first aid type book, right? Um, and then this previous year, we were also having, they'd have sort of like two hour sort of lectures here and there that were all devoted to board prep um, that the students was optional to go to if they wanted to, to, to have that board prep. So we also have some board prep here, which I think is, excuse me, <clears throat> good and beneficial for the students. We also have uh, simulation lab, which I didn't touch on a ton, but we have four different sim labs, um, and we have multiple different human patient simulators, okay? So a human patient simulator, if you've never interacted with one, is essentially a full-size robot. Um, um, so yeah, we have Sim Man, who does a little of everything I say. Sim Man will blink, pupils react to light, you can monitor fluids out, it has drug recognition, um, you can actually really shock it um, with the defibrillator. Um, and so the idea is you can do a lot of good sort of emergency medicine type scenarios with it. Um, we have a birthing simulator. We have multiple pediatric models from um, infant or, you know, neonatology um, <clears throat> um, models like just born, excuse me, to, so we have some that look more of like an eight to 10 year old, right? So um, we have a bunch of different models. We have one that's waist up known as Harvey, um, who's for detailed cardiovascular and lung sounds. Um, so we do try and have a lot of simulated clinical exposures. You really don't start using the human patient simulators until further on, second, third year, uh, with a couple of exceptions, like Harvey, when they're doing the cardiovascular system, right? They're going to use Harvey for some of those things to hear heart murmurs or palpitations and things like that, too. Um, but in terms of, you know, I, I think we do a lot with our student wellness program and, and making sure students are, are happy and have what they need to be successful, okay? Let's see. Is it possible to access this recorded session? Yes, it'll be recorded. I can email it out to everyone. Um, our communications person might come in and clean it up first um, versus sending out the full raw thing. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, I might just send it out if you want to watch the full. I don't know. We're going on an hour and a half. You're, you're more than welcome to. 
If our 200 GPA is a 3.1, but our science GPA is a 3.0, will our application be considered? The answer is yes. That, that 3.1 is really for the cumulative GPA. Um, so if you meet that and the MCAT requirement, you'll kind of get that full review and we'll look for trends and grades and things like that. Do you accept advanced placement credits for prereqs um, if they were transferred? So we will accept advanced placement as long as you have college transcripts or college credit on your transcripts, okay? So um, as long as you have that, it's fine. Some schools, they just, you don't have to take it, but there's no college credit, that wouldn't count. But if your, if your transcript says, you know, biology eight hours, P credit, that's fine, we'll count that. For the question on the secondary application to ask about updates since primary, would you say it does not look good to have any updates besides seeking employment after recently graduating? Will that be something that is looked down upon? And the, the answer for that is, is no. Um, it really depends, right? Some people submit their primary in May, but they might not get a secondary until October, right? So they might have something there. If you're getting your supplemental now and you apply it in May, you might not really have anything other than you've continued working or, or whatever it may be. Um, so no, it's not going to look be looked down upon if you don't have anything for that section, right? Or it's limited. Um, it's really just going to depend, right? Because some students don't get that for months, depending on waiting on MCATs or other things. If you're in a master's program, a lot of times put you on hold for grades, and so sometimes that gives them a chance if they haven't applied, if they applied like two, three months ago to fill in something. So, good question. Yes, you're welcome. Um, so, I do not see any other questions at this time. Um, so, if any pop in while I'm saying goodbye, I'll answer those. But once again, I thank you for taking the time to, to listen to me talk at your computer or phone for, for an hour and a half. We really appreciate it. Like I said, reach out. Um, once we start having in-person interview or uh, tours again, we'll post it on the website. Uh, I assume since we're doing virtual interviews all fall, it probably won't be till spring, if anything. Um, but just know, stay tuned on our website for that. Um, and I'm available to, to talk to you via video chat or on the phone if you want to talk about your individual applications at some point as well. So thank you. Someone said, did you mention secondary is being sent out today? The answer to that is yes. So uh, I, I got a live update during the presentation that they were sending out secondaries today. You know, it can take some time um, if you're in this first batch that's getting them, but you should get something today if you're verified and we have everything on. All right. So thank you again, everyone. I really appreciate it and uh, have a great rest of your day.